You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Richard Knowles of Knowles & Associates in Vancouver. Welcome to the show, Richard. Well, thank you for having me back, Jim. Just before we started the show, Richard, you were saying the equity markets are perhaps facing their biggest challenge in years right now. Yes, um, it certainly has been a bit of a test. Um, we have now earnings coming out third quarter. Third quarter earnings are usually the most uh, testy time in any year because um, most corporations take their write-downs before year-end, and the third quarter will show any uh, negative results that they want to uh, factor into their financials earlier than the year-end. So that always puts a little bit of pressure on the markets, plus anything else that may be happening. Uh, we look at any kind of other f- geopolitical factors. Right now we have a war, uh, which is not very good news. But it can be also be very positive news on the economy, unfortunately. And that's sort of the negative uh, truth about the positive side of war, which helps uh, economies grow rather than contract. And then also we have the situation uh, for the midterm elections in the United States, which uh, doesn't necessarily affect us here in Canada or Europe, but certainly does put a, uh, a specter over the American markets, which have been going gung-ho for a long, long time. And now it looks as though they might have a bit of a correction. And, of course, we already know that there's billionaires and many millions and billions of dollars banking on a correction downwards because of the potential sell-off at any given time after a big, big bull run. So it's it, we have a lot of almost like a triple witching hour happening now. and we've, We're off our highs from August uh, and certainly are, are down pretty much around the globe. Some good news on the oil front for Canada. Well, actually, two pieces of good news. Canada's crude oil exports to the U.S. have topped 3 million barrels a day for the first time ever. And also, the European Union has reversed its stand on taking oil from the Alberta oil sands. For five years, they claimed it was uh, high-polluting oil that they didn't want any part of. But now, with the threat of Russia possibly turning off the taps, countries like uh, Italy, the Netherlands, and the U.K. say, hey, we'll take that Canadian oil sands crude, no problem. I know. Necessity is truly the mother of invention. And at the end of the day, when... uh when you when you were ever wondering what to do to figure out a situation, why people change the sta- change a stance on their opinion, uh, why something suddenly changes for any reason, always the big rule: follow the money. And in this case, of course, it is a matter of money to promote uh, or necessity, if you will, to promote the energy that they will require, and then they're opening up other opportunities with Canada. This is very good for Canada. I think we were. We're so dependent, I should say, on the U.S., and while this includes, this news news item does also include the fact that we've increased our oil uh, sales to the U.S., I think it's very important to realize that we've, we've developed these strategies where we're doing more trade, we want to develop more trade with Europe and China, and uh, while the China situation is always up in the air because we're philosophically completely distinct from China, we're in, actually in opposition our philosophical, political, as well as socio-economic positions that we take as a as a country are the antithesis, practically speaking, uh, of what China does as states. China is a complete opposite in their uh, leadership um, and social democratic approach to to their their people. Completely opposite from us, they're more militaristic. They don't have a problem with detain you know detaining. Uh, against someone's uh, freedom of rights. There are no freedom of rights in the, in, really in China. Uh, it's just whatever's convenient for the political power to accept. And these kinds of, and, you know, we, we're willing to swallow our ethics for business. And this is, again, getting back to my point that always we want to find out what the reasoning is, always just follow the money. And I think Canada's ethics have been sold out in, in a number of different ways, unfortunately. But we do have to supply ourselves with... Uh, uh, income, and uh, we hope that through moral suasion we can have some effect over the Chinese government and their future. And the only way you can really control any economy is through uh, providing certain services to that economy, which they value. And in that case, uh, you can have some say in their future and their decisions. So I think it's a good positioning for Canada. The IMF says Canadian real estate is overpriced by 10%, and you say you've noticed 
perhaps at least locally in the Vancouver area, a slight drop in prices? Yeah, this could be more seasonal. Uh, I've noticed a single week uh, there's a number of price changes in uh, in the same areas across the real estate board uh, sales for residential, not commercial in this case, but I'm just speaking residential because that's what I follow. And they've dropped uh, on average up to five or five percent or so. And these are you know more than usual. <laughs> you do see the odd overpricing, and then someone reprices it down a bit because it just wasn't appropriate for that area. You know, some salesmen in, in real estate will will promise you many things, but can't deliver them based on the fact of the actual region and what the local sales have been. However, uh, it does seem to be a more. I'm not sure if it's just a seasonal shift. It's uh, very common to see in in the fall uh, price changes downwards from what they were in the summer. It doesn't look dramatic yet. I think we've got a good su- sustainable real estate market across Canada and the major, certainly in the major areas. Although there is always a, a threat of a correction based on increasing interest rates. That would likely take years to actually, could be one to two years after an interest rate hike, and it would have to be severe interest rate hikes, and I don't foresee that happening. Uh, At best, we might see small interest rate increases uh, if our inflationary environment is increasing, our economy is strong. They might slightly increase interest rates over a longer period of time, but that might take two years before we get to a significant increase, and at that point, Uh, One would presume the economy is very strong to be able to handle the interest rate hike, and it wouldn't suddenly be a surprise to anyone that's uh, financing their mortgage to have to come up with new money. So consequently, I don't don't really see interest rate hikes really affecting housing markets um, unless they were suddenly overnight to go up 1% or 2%, which we know is not going to happen. It's just impractical to even discuss that. We'll have more with Richard Knowles right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with Richard Knowles of Knowles & Associates in Vancouver. SNC Lavalin caught up in a scandal where they were apparently taking kickbacks from Libyan officials and trying to arrange things through bribery. They got some very big contracts out of it. But now the boss of the company says the projects they won through corruption have not been profitable, and he said they'd be lucky if they made one nickel on them. It doesn't look, at least on this side of the ocean, that bribing people pays off. (laughs) Well, that may be part of the settlement. Uh, he's supposed to, you know, downplay uh, how bribes have helped their company. I, one never really knows at this juncture what uh, what is really political rhetoric for defense. Yeah, maybe uh, the lawyers versus, just told him to say that. Of course, yeah, it just makes him sound better before judgment, um, saying, you know, downplaying, oh, look, it's, this is a bad thing to do. I wouldn't do it again, you know. I'm, I've changed my position. It could be that or it could be very sincerely true, and he's just making a statement. However, you know, there's no way to prove that because it was done illegally and consequently there's no way to track the money. And so it's a very simple statement to make. I, I'm not going to say either way. I can't comment either way on that. I'm just making a point that it could be in, in either direction. Alternatively, you also have him stating that um, uh, if there is a legal suit that carries through and it's too strong against the company, the company could be forced to sell. That's what he was stating. and might have to sell to a higher bidder or, or go out of business in theory. If the liability to the company is very high for these these so-called uh, illegal contracts, so there's another statement, sort of to in defense, which he's been probably asked to say could be uh, asked to say, but he's maybe quite true. And regardless, it's to defend the company and also defend against a high cost uh, settlement uh, to trying to defend the company from foreclosure, which uh, you know I, it's very difficult to state that too because they are a very large uh, corporation. So, you know, these kinds of statements, you you know, you have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, I will accept them at face value at the moment until you can prove otherwise, because at least in Canada, for the moment, they're still innocent until proven guilty. However, my understanding is he's been proven guilty, so all of the statements, uh, to some degree, are, have yet to be qualified. So I take them with a grain of salt. Uh, according to the Huffington Post, SNC-Lavalin actually had a secret code for bribery, so in their accounting... <laughs> Uh, one of their salespeople could actually put that number down, and the company knew, okay, this is being used to pay a bribe. 
And and also, I know one of the uh, female executives from the company was charged in connection with uh, attempting to smuggle one of the sons of Muammar Gaddafi to the United States when Libya was going down in flames. Yeah. So, but here, at least the company's claiming they didn't make any money on this stuff, so why did you do it? Yeah. And then finally here in Vancouver, a financial advisor is being sued after a $4 million lottery winner claims that this person went and squandered at least half of their $4 million win. Yes, uh, it is a very uh, sh absolutely shameful situation. Um, I followed this a little bit, and unfortunately I've, I've had to handle a couple of the clients that was with this woman uh, that left her, fortunately, and uh, at least from what I can see, I, I would say fortunately in these just two cases uh, because they were not properly aligned with the investments, and I've certainly shored up that situation. Um, I can't really comment because she is currently under investigation, and um, I, I'm in the public eye at the moment. I don't think it's fair to um, to hedge any prejudice against her. She has a right to defend herself. Um, and I think that in, in most cases, it can also be a little bit of misunderstanding on both sides of the equation. Uh, I do know I've, I've had excellent relationships with all of my clients. I don't have a single client ever claiming I've done anything untoward. Um, there can be questions, uh, you know, the only communication I might have with a client was my understanding that they were more conservative. And then they changed their mind. They wanted to be more aggressive, but they actually never told me. That's the worst case I've ever had in 25 years in practice. How can a person tell if they're getting a good financial advisor? Do you actually do it the old-fashioned way? Ask your friends, who's doing a good job for you? Oh, there's a number of different ways. I think you can always walk in, uh, call up. Uh, I think it's very important to do two things. You can call um, an established firm that you might recognize. It could be working with your bank. However, the problem with the bank advisors are that they are very nepotistic they tend to are to, they tend to be told to have a corral of investments which are typically promoted by that firm consequently you're truly not getting an unbiased advice further they're almost always in just securities they don't have the full licensing of other investment opportunities which might include insurance and investments or insured investments called segregated funds or other types of term deposits and other things that are available through other institutions which might be a great advantage uh, both in the insurance and other banking areas that you can get into, like credit unions. It's very important to get a hold of an independent financial advisor in your investigations. I always say investigate three different groups, three different people from different types of organizations, not just the banks. Uh, the banks, unfortunately, are trying to convince everyone that they have the corner of all good things. That's not true. I work with the banks, uh, in fact, as an independent financial planner with a boutique, a large boutique firm, an independent firm, uh, Custom Plan Financial Group, which is prior, uh, priorly known as the Equinox Financial Group. We have access to all of the bank products, uh, virtually all of the bank products required in a, in a potential uh, person's portfolio, in addition to access to all of the investment, uh, insurance, and other types of alternative products, uh, even exempt products that are lesser known in the, uh, in the established world, giving a full uh, range of access to everything from real estate through to, uh, of course, your standard stock and bond investments, wrap accounts, and everything else, including full research and even discount brokerage. So consequently, I believe that it's important to ask for three things. One, uh, what is the what is the ability of this firm? What's the full complement of access to investment products that you can provide and are licensed to do? Secondly, what is the compensation for doing these kinds of things? How are you compensated? And thirdly, do you have three referral uh, individuals that can speak uh, independently of you that I could uh, phone and get, get referrals from so I can qualify you and qualify the things you've told me today. And in those cases, that's probably the best way to at least assess. But eyeball to eyeball is the best way to get a good feel to see if this individual is doing saying what they have and you feel comfortable working with them because they will become your partner. It's like interviewing someone for a business. You plan to have them for quite a while. You want to know that they'd be a trusted employee, someone that will work for you and always think first of you, if they can, when it applies to your situation and is safeguarding your best interests. Finally, of course, you know, when you're, um, whenever you're in a situation where you're going to be dealing with money, you want to have an assessment process, of course, over time. And, um, you know, always remember the rule. If it's too good to be true, it likely isn't.
going to happen, right? So uh, it likely is too good to be true. So, you know, when you get pr ma amassed promises from people, oh, I can guarantee you 18% or, you know, X number of dollars a month are going to be guaranteed to you and these kind of lofty promises, no matter who you are, no matter how, uns how sophisticated or unsophisticated you are as an investor, always remember, double check the numbers before you commit and bring this information to someone that you might regard professionally to be able to comment on that, someone like myself. I may be just there for you to answer a few questions. If you gave a call up to me and asked me these questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. And then you could take that back with you to your advisor saying, listen, I don't think you can do this. And I talked to a guy with 20 years' experience in the industry, and he said he knows about all the investments available out there, and you've promised me something that's just not available. So get second opinions. Very good idea. Richard, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Richard Knowles of Knowles & Associates. If you have any questions for Richard, you can contact him by sending your email to Richard K, that's the letter K, at customplanfinancial.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. You can find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. We're also on YouTube. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.